Good morning. Welcome to the Worship of Good Samaritan Presbyterian Church as we begin to gather around the Word of God and glorify Him with our worship and our understanding and open our ears. The call to worship this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Lord, as we gather in your presence, we ask that your spirit would be with us and, and fill us with the breath of life that comes from your great presence in this creation of ours. And we ask, Lord, that you would change our lives, that you would draw us near and give us hopeful hearts and allow us to see clearly the expectation that Christ is coming into the world. For the sake of your love for us, you have given yourself to us in the act of creation and in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And we wait to celebrate again the advent of the Christ in this world. And so we, we gather in his name and we pray through the power of your spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Our Advent candle lighting this week will be done by the Ellison family. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let all creation sing for joy at the coming of the Lord. The Lord of hosts is coming to restore us. God's face will shine and we will be saved. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ, who is called the Son of the Most High, and of whose kingdom there will be no end. About the hour of Christ's coming, no one knows. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Hear the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, it is good and right for God's people to confess their sins and come into his presence, trusting in his mercy and forgiveness. The invitation to confession this week is from James chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, after which we will join in a time of silent reflection. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful. the gospel in Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Your sins are washed away and you are set free to live a life that is a glory to God because of his mercy and steadfast love and how it has been shown to all of us in Jesus the Christ. Amen. The scripture this morning is from Mark chapter 1 verses 1 through 8 beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you. Spirit. Here ends the reading from God's Holy Word. Mark is the earliest gospel and the shortest gospel, so perhaps it's not surprising that he wastes no time in getting to the point, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Before we get to, the, to John the Baptist, which you know I'm going to do because he's one of my faves, um, I want to take a moment and unpack that loaded opening line of this gospel. First of all, it's, it, it is the beginning. Mark writes his entire gospel, not just this first verse, with that sense in mind, that this is just the beginning. He never intended to record all the teachings of Jesus and actions of the, of the things that Jesus did. He never intended his gospel to be the final word. It's, it's just a launch pad for the good news. That's why Mark often seems kind of breathless to tell you immediately they did this and immediately they did that. It's written more like a newspaper article than, than any of the other Gospels. There's not a lot of reflection on, on, on what, what this means and what that means or how it fulfills prophecy, although he does take a minute right at the beginning to say that it does, in fact, fulfill prophecy. But his goal is to launch people out into the world as disciples not just to tell them a, 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 some cute little stories. It's a launch pad for the good news. And, it, and that's another thing about this statement. It should always be good news. If we fail as a church, it's because we lose the simple notion and, and, and that the gospel is supposed to be good news for all of creation, for all humankind. If we fail as Christians, it's because we use the name of Jesus and, and, and the banner of the gospel to, to justify wars and to burn people at the stake and commit all kinds of atrocities in the name of Jesus. That's not good news. Mark also makes a bold statement right here at the beginning. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That a positive statement, he removes any doubt that you might have later when he plays around the edges and treats Jesus' identity in the context of his story as a little bit of a secret and has Jesus winking and, and nudging his disciples saying, oh, don't tell anybody about this part until later. I mean, it was one thing to call somebody the Christ or, or in Hebrew, the Hebrew version of it, Messiah. It means anointed one. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a divine being. It just means that you are called and appointed by God to be a, a, a savior, a rescuer, a leader, uh, uh, somebody who, rise, who helps people rise up from their stations in life and do great things. So it, whether you use the Greek term Christ or the, the Hebrew term Messiah, it, it means the same thing. But John gives us, or Mark gives us more information. He says not only is he the Christ, he is also the Son of God. And, and that, that is the part that, that really draws the line between what a lot of people thought Jesus might be to what Mark is saying he is. That means there's a divine nature there. It, it's not actually a term that Jesus uses to describe himself very much. In the context of the Gospels, Jesus uses the, the phrase son of man more often. despite the fact that Mark may do some things later to make that seem like it's not supposed to be common knowledge, he, he tells us right off the bat, Son of God. 
another attribute of Mark's telling, the mode of telling is the balance between what has been and what is happening now. He, he may not be as fixated on fulfilling Hebrew prophecy as Matthew, but he's not ignoring it either. We will run a clock, we will run a clock across a lot of present tense urgency in Mark with an occasional glance back at what was written. It starts, though, with John the Baptist fulfilling a very special prophecy from Isaiah, a prophecy that was given to a people as they came out of exile, a prophecy that was given to a people who needed to heal. John is there to prepare the way for Jesus. He is a fulfillment of the role, not only the, the actual specific prophecy of Isaiah, but of the entire office of prophet in, in the, with, throughout Hebrew history. John is the embodiment of what a prophet should be. He is like if you, he's the one that if you look up prophet in the dictionary, his picture should be right next to it because he looked the part, he sounded the part, he was what prophets were supposed to be. He's an attention getter for sure. The wild man in the desert, giving the call to repentance, challenging the status quo, calling out the brood of vipers that, that, that were the religious authorities, and rhetorically knocking some heads. But John's message is, is different in a lot of ways than the others who may have looked and sounded like him. There, there were always people willing, there, there have been and there, there will probably always be people who are, are willing to shout repent at the top, at the top of their lungs. And, and they might draw a crowd if they have a good act. But we all know how we all know how broken and crooked things can be, right? I mean, it, 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 that always has an audience. The call to repentance is always going to resonate with, with, with people because we, we look around us and we see how messed up things are. And, and so prophets of doom will always find their place, especially if the prophet of doom points his crooked finger people you don't like very much. This tendency has not gone away by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, it, it, as far as I can tell, it's pretty much why Twitter exists. Because it answers some deep need that we have to hear other voices tell people how wrong they are. And, and, and sometimes we even can take that the way it's meant to, to be taken and understand that it, it might, that finger might be pointed at us. Most of us know we're not perfect. We know we need to repent. And it goes back to that simple reality that, honestly, that, that, that I've told you before, and I'll steal this from Richard Rohr, that we're not punished for our sins. We're punished by our sins. And so the, the call to repentance can sound like a, a, an invitation to be set free. And that's why people kept coming out to John in the desert and getting dunked in that muddy little river. John and Jesus both have moments where they can sound sort of prophet of doom-ish, let's say. They can pronounce woe to, to somebody or something. You know, sometimes it's other, other cities that, that, are, that don't follow the ways of God, but most of the time it's, it's actually religious people. It's actually the authorities, the Pharisees and the scribes. They're the ones who get the most woe-to-you statements from both John and Jesus. They're the ones that get called a brood of vipers. But really, if you take the totality of what they both said, you see something very different than doom at the core of it. Forgiveness. It, it was what John started with. It's what, he was, it's what he was doing out there. He, wasn't, he, he may have been using the tone of voice and the appearance of somebody who's saying the end is near, but what he was really saying is that the beginning is here. The beginning of a way to live where you don't have to, you don't have to feel this crushing weight of guilt on your shoulders all the time. It, it's quite a novel thing, too, honestly, if you think about it. You may not realize it, having lived most of your life with at least the background noise of Christianity going on. But think about it. Most prophets of doom have an agenda that seeks to try and get people to do what they want, whether it's a revolution or a building campaign, John, John and Jesus don't want that from anybody. 
they, they, there are even people that expect them to want a revolution, and they never, they never pull the trigger on that. John doesn't want anything from ever, anyone. He, he offers them forgiveness of sins. He doesn't, and he doesn't make a careful list of what sins they need to remedy. The remedy is all the same. It's the same repentance and the same water from the same muddy little river. The, 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 the people that John that heard this were people who had grown up in, with learning for their entire life a fairly complicated system of sacrificial penance. From the time they were little children, they, they learned that what it says in the law, that if you do this, you, you make this sacrifice, and then everything's cool. They, they had to reimagine what God was. And believe me, they, they thought they had the market pretty much cornered on who God was. They were the chosen people. They were the ones that, who God rescued out of, out of Egypt. They were the ones that traced their lineage back to Abraham, the, the one who God reckoned righteous. To say that what John was offering them was world-shaking is actually a little bit of an understatement. I, w- I would love to tell you that we got the message, that, that we who have the benefit of hearing about John the Baptist and Jesus the Christ for 2,000 years have figured this out and we steadfastly live by it, but at almost every turn that we had the chance to do so, we tended to turn back to the old ideas of trying to pay for forgiveness. We, we, just, we just can't seem to imagine that God would be so loose and free with this forgiveness. That, I mean, that all we have to do is repent. All we have to do is turn around. We, we don't have to take a bunch of steps in the, in, in the right direction. We just have to turn away from the thing that is, that is crushing us, and breaking us. We just have to turn away from the selfishness and the violence that, that is at the core of so much that is wrong with the world. It sounds, repentance sounds easy, doesn't it? But in reality, it's, it's not. Because you always are confronted with the need for it. It's something that has to be done over and over and over and over again. Like, like any kind of exercise that, that is going to, going to produce growth. You can't just do one bench press and then expect to look like Charles Atlas. I always... I always imagine that many of the people that John baptized were repeat customers. It, it, I mean, it makes reasonable sense, and it's just how people are. You know, they, they come out, and they get baptized, and they say, I feel so good, I feel so free, I feel so loved and forgiven. And then they go back to where they came from, to their, their regular nine-to-five life, and, you know, things happen, sin reasserts its grip, and you, you start to... You start to suffer from your sins again. And so, you know, hey, I, I remember how good that felt. I'm going to go out and I'm going to see John again. And, and you know, John had to, he had to understand that that, that that tendency was precisely the thing that he was fighting against. Because that's what the temple was. It was a way you could go periodically and offer your offerings and burn your incense and pray your prayers and feel that you were better, or at least a little bit less in danger of God's wrath. And as different as the, the different as the setting that John was in and the way he that, that was from the temple, and, and as different as his camel hair vestments were from the from the fancy ephods that the priests wore in the temple, he had to he had to recognize that the people who he was preaching to were the exact same people. And, that, and that's, you know, he didn't want to turn this thing into an empty religious ritual. And, and that's, it, that's, the, that, that's the reason why we Reformed types insist on baptizing people just once. I mean, our Baptist brothers and sisters have a bit of a different perspective on this, and, you know, we don't all agree on it. But in, in our tradition, the reason why we only baptize people once, whether they're baptized as babies or as adults, is, is because we don't want to rob it of the sacredness of the moment, of that forgiveness. And also, and this is probably even more important, because we are trying to hold on to the reality that God's forgiveness is always there, and it doesn't need renewal or refreshing. 
we, we, we need to be reminded of it, but there are other ways to do that. There, there are prayers of confession and absolution. So we set aside that water so that it is something special, because it symbolizes something different. And that's, that's, that's what John knew about this. He knew that the water, of the, the water of repentance needs to be applied again and again and again and again. You can't just take one bath and expect you're always going to be clean. But what Jesus was going to do was different. And that's why John says he, he's not worthy to, to untie the sandals that Jesus was wearing, because he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus was up to something greater, and John knew it. Jesus was going to invite people into the relationship that is the source of mercy and forgiveness. Jesus clearly hoped that his disciples would get this message and internalize it, and it would be the root of what they did and who they were. The repentance would be real enough to actually change things. They would keep the forgiveness that they received in the front of their mind. Jesus and John shared a very basic message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. They, they repeat it. And, and Jesus elaborates on what it means in, in his parables. This, what is this kingdom of heaven? And, and he teaches his disciples about how it's supposed to come near through their lives and through, through who they are and where they go and what they do. That's what being his disciple was about. John was the voice calling in the wilderness, getting people's attention. Jesus did it a different way. He showed up where they were, in, in their town squares and in their homes. John was the announcement. He was the, he was the, the billboard on the side of the road. He was, he was the, 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 the commercial that always seems to come on louder than the show you're watching. But Jesus was the thing that he was advertising, and that he was announcing. The way that the kingdom of heaven actually happens resembles the way Jesus happens more than the way John happens. That, that's why Mark does treat it as sort of like a secret. It, it's because it's organic. It bubbles up in acts of mercy and kindness. Forgiveness, forgiveness is not a strain on, on the kingdom of heaven. It is its primary attribute. And that's, that's the thing that, that religious people have a hard time remembering. If you recall, the thing that seemed to get under the Pharisees' skin about Jesus, other than him deliberately breaking the third commandment about the Sabbath, was that he was always going about telling folks that their sin was forgiven. I mean, healing the blind is, is one thing, but forgiving sins? I mean, who does he think he is? The Son of God. That just it seemed a bit too audacious and even heretical. I mean, people that feel forgiven might be hard to control with fear of divine wrath. People who see God as loving and merciful might not be so inclined to give the first fruits and the best of their harvest to the guys with the fancy clothes in the temples in exchange for protection, exoneration, or whatever. It still works today. Preachers who adopt the prophet of Dune message can still draw some pretty big crowds. Apparently people do, as I said before, like to be threatened with a little wrath of God and, sit and, told, and being told that saying magic words will get them off the hook, but only them and not other people. That's usually the, the left turn at the end. But by forgiving people right up front, the good news... I mean, it, it, it takes some things, some tools, out of the religious toolbox. It, it doesn't stop folks from trying to use them, and it doesn't mean that they're not effective for, for growing your organization or, or you know, raising funds, but look, it doesn't end up being really good news. I mean, it, what, it, what using the, 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 prophet of the, the prophecies of doom and judgment and wrath does is, is it just scares people into, into being docile and doing what you want them to do. But it, it ends up not actually being good news at all. It just is, leads us to, to multiple exercises in futility. That's why Jesus is greater than John and why John is not fit to untie his sandals. Not because their message 
is different, but because G John told people about forgiveness. Most of them believed it only very briefly. Jesus showed them forgiveness. He showed them what it looked like. He showed them that it can conquer death. He showed them that it is the active participation of God's love in his creation. It's, it's no mystery why, why people lapse back into the other way of doing things. It just seems safer and more predictable. There, there is something familiar and comfortable about being baptized with water. We, we, we do it to babies, after all. It must not actually be dangerous, but being actually baptized with the Holy Spirit, it is. It's awfully dangerous. That means you will have to get to a place where, having been forgiven and loved that deeply, you will have to forgive and love people that deeply as well. And that is what... That is what just terrifies most of us. It's, it's, not, it's not that we don't like the idea of love in the abstract. It sounds like a wonderful idea. But when it means forgiving somebody that did you wrong, and I mean really did you wrong, not, not just somebody who cut you off in traffic, I mean somebody who hurts you at your core, to forgive them. To, to forgive somebody who damaged you. That is not an easy thing to do at all. And think about that on a global scale. Think about how many people injure God and God's creation. Think about people who kill God's children. Think about people who destroy God's balance and oppress God's creatures. Think about God forgiving them over and over and over and over again. Not just for the seven billion people that live on this planet right now, but for all the billions and billions of people who have lived since the first humans stood upright and said a word. Actually, living in relationship with a holy and loving God takes away any excuse you might have for acting like a jerk. Honestly, too many people seem quite attached to their excuses. And that's why you have so many Christians, but not as many people who actually act like Jesus, who actually live out the implications of the statement that they are forgiven. It can get real complicated and really difficult. That's why it's a good thing still only the beginning. Let's pray. Lord, your grace surrounds us. And if we see and feel that grace, but do not show it by our love and our ability to forgive, by our acts of kindness and mercy that, that are the way that the kingdom breaks through into this world. And we are a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal as the apostle described himself. Lord, we ask. We ask for the inspiration to follow what Jesus showed us. To live a life that is rooted in forgiveness, that, is, that, that knows at its core that there is love, and that love is the most powerful of all things. And so, Lord, we, we pray. We pray for ourselves and we pray for our world. We pray for the people who we probably too easily label our enemies. We pray for those who have done us wrong. Because, Lord, if we do not pray for them, then we cannot be healed. If we do not pray for, for all of our brothers and sisters who are also your children, then we cannot be healed. And we will continue to suffer and be punished by our sins, not for them. So we ask, Lord, that, that here, as we make a beginning, as we hear this good news, that, that that would change 
the way that we approach our lives, the way that we approach our neighbors, the way that we approach everything that we do and everywhere that we go. That there would be no part of our lives where we, where we continue to make those excuses for not forgiving and for not loving and for not living like we are filled with your grace. Jesus does not give us any excuses because he did not make any. He does not give us a way out because he did not take the way out. He went through. He went through the worst brutality and the deepest darkness that we can imagine. And yet, he still forgave, he still loved, and he rose again. And so Lord, we, we look to him and we find the example that we are supposed to follow, and it is daunting indeed, and we know we could not do it without your spirit, even as we know that we cannot pray as we should, and so we rely on and we put our hope and trust in the spirit interceding for us, even as we say the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you are going, God is sending you. Wherever you are now, he has a reason for you to be. Jesus Christ, who lives in you, has something he wants you to do right here, right now, where you are. Believe this and go in his grace, his mercy, his love, and his power. And God's people said,